If you want to know the secrets of existence and the true meaning of life, I can't help you. But if you want some book recommendations, why not try reading the ones I wrote? If you are a fan of giant monster mayhem and anime weirdness, why not try Operation Red Dragon The Daikaiju Wars Part 1? If horror is more your style, you can't go wrong with the occult mafia. Those who enjoy their fantasy with a dark twist may be interested in Emerald of Maddox City. And if you're interested in shared universes, why not read all three? Hop on down to the description for links to all three books on Amazon. Enjoy whichever ones you read, and enjoy the video. Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am the Omni Viewer, fresh off of watching episode 9 of Godzilla Singular Point. And I won't say this episode is worse than what's come before, but I don't necessarily think it's an improvement over what's come before either. I'm not sure how much I'll actually have to say about this one, so I'll just get right into it. First of all, Godzilla once again metamorphoses into Godzilla Terrestris. And Godzilla Terrestris is just ugly. Let's get that out of the way first. It is one of the worst Godzilla designs I have ever seen. Some people have said that this is meant to be an homage to Gorosaurus, like how Amphibia was based on Varin and Aquatilus was based on Titanosaurus. This is supposed to be based on Gorosaurus. I personally don't see it. I see no resemblance to Gorosaurus whatsoever. If Godzilla Terrestris looks like any pre-existing version of Godzilla, it's the 1998 one. Maybe mixed with a boa constrictor or something, but it doesn't look like Gorosaurus, so I have no idea where that came from. And if that was the intention, then I have to ask if the person who came up with that design actually knows what Gorosaurus looks like. But even taking that out of the equation, I still think the design doesn't look very good. And from the looks of things, the one scene that Godzilla Terrestris has, which yet again feels like it was ripped right out of Shin Godzilla, but with a little bit of a twist to just make it different enough, uh, aside from that, it looks like in the next episode he's going to become Godzilla Ultima which makes Godzilla Terrestris the most pointless version of Godzilla ever. This is a mutation that I feel didn't really need to happen. Why not just have him go straight into Ultima? If the point was to come up with a design that would walk on land, I mean, what's the point of this one? I have no idea, but either way, it exists, and... Toho is able to sell the license to Bandai to make more toys, so I guess that's the reason we have Godzilla Terrestris, because I can't think of any in-story reason. Now, of course, the question still remains, why did he have to cocoon in order to do that? Because he crystallized himself in order to transform, but since he's supposedly a source for the archetypes, People initially said that the reason he was able to go from Aquatilus to Amphibia in the blink of an eye was because he could just manipulate his own reality around him. But he had to cocoon in order to become Godzilla Terrestris, and from the looks of it, Godzilla Terrestris is going to go right into being Godzilla Ultima. So which is it? Can Godzilla in this series manipulate reality like that, or can't he? Does he need time, or does he not need time? It really does feel like they were just sort of making this up as they went along. It's sort of like watching kids playing war and they're like, Ha! I shot you! You're dead! No, you didn't because I was wearing armor the whole time! Oh yeah? Well, you stepped on a landmine so you blew up! Well, I didn't blow up because I'm actually superhuman! It feels like that's the way this Godzilla is being written at this point. And unless there's some sort of incredible revelation at the end that completely rewrites everything we've seen up to this point, I'm just going to say that it really doesn't make sense. And I don't see how it can make sense. In terms of the plot, well, now there's suddenly a sense of urgency. Now the characters are moving like there's a disaster happening in the moment and they have to actually do stuff. Why they weren't acting that way the whole time is still a mystery to me. It really does feel like... I, I, this is what I was worried about. I was worried that this would be the kind of series that thought it had all the time in the world to tell its story until it suddenly realized the deadline was approaching so it had to cram everything in all at once. 
I was worried about that from the start. And look at where we are. That's precisely what's happening. Boy, I bet even Yun Arakawa couldn't have predicted that one. Speaking of him, people have pointed this out, and it's kind of thrown me for a loop too, but in the previous episodes, there's been this weird pacing issue, I guess you would call it, where... Uh, or is it a pacing issue? Whatever you would call it, it's weird, because there would be these scenes where it's clear that Yun is actively engaged in something regarding the monsters, but we still stop and he's able to have these long text conversations with Mei, which have taken up quite a good bit of certain episodes. And it's always felt kind of weird, like they're interruptions. Like, how is he able to have these lengthy, complex conversations while he's actively hunting Angiris? How does this timeline actually line up? And it turns out in episode 9, we see that he actually does stop in the middle of these events to have these long conversations with May. It actually happens. We can confirm that he really does just stop in the middle of when something is happening in order to have these conversations. And just because we see it happening in real time doesn't really make it feel any better. It still feels like an interruption. And... <sighs> Yeah, it's just kind of jarring. Just because we can actually see it doesn't mean it actually works. At least we now know that apparently it's been happening the whole time. For what little consolation that provides. It also looks as if Dr. Lee might be dead or might die at the beginning of the next episode unless she has a skin of her teeth escape. Either way, I don't really care. I don't really know who this woman is, I don't know why I should care about her, so if she dies or if she lives, it makes no difference to me. The only death I've actually felt anything for is Anguirus is at this point. He's the one entity in this whole show who, when he died, I was like, oh man, I liked him. And that was just after far less screen time than any of the human characters have gotten. So if Lee dies, or if any of these characters die, I don't see myself feeling a thing for them. And of course, Godzilla still doesn't really do anything other than briefly reenact a scene from Shin. I swear, it's like whenever Godzilla shows up in an anime, the crew sets a challenge for themselves to see how long they can go before Godzilla has to actually have an impact on the story. And whoever can go the longest wins. But of course, he's most likely going to become Godzilla Ultima in the next episode, and as the source of the catastrophe, that means he'll theoretically have more to do? But then again, I'm not counting on that, and I guess I don't really have much else to say about this episode. It's on par with the episode that came before it, but it's not an improvement. And now the series, I'm guessing, is going to be in a mad dash to get to the finish line. Whether or not that's going to be a worthwhile journey... I am not especially optimistic, but time will tell. Still got, what, three or four episodes left? Well, it's 13. I'm on episode 9 now, so however many there are, I don't really care. It's only got so much time to get to the end of the story, and it's either going to move at a rapid pace now, or it's going to continue dragging its feet. In either case, I'm not entirely sure it's going to stick the landing. But I'll find out when I watch the next episode, and that's all I have to say on this one. Until such time as we meet again, this is the Omni Viewer signing off. If you enjoyed what you just saw, hop on down to the description for links to Patreon, DeviantArt, and all of our social media, as well as links for Operation Red Dragon, The Daikaiju Wars Part 1, The Occult Mafia, and Emerald of Maddox City, three original novels I think you'll really enjoy. Thank you all, and we appreciate your support.